This is the countryside of Gorakhpur district in eastern Uttar Pradesh. Less than six decades back, this district was the fiefdom of landlords who levied their own taxes. Among them was a tax called Motaruna and another called Gramophony. The first levied for the use of cars. The second for those who listen to music on gramophones. The two curious instances were cited in the UP Zamindari Abolition Committee's report of 1952 to plead powerfully for the abolition of landlordism. Today, Gorakhpur is divided into three districts, with a fourth likely to emerge soon. Zamindari is gone, and the second green revolution has transformed the district from a malaria-infested, flood-prone swamp into one of UP's agriculturally prosperous districts. The city of Gorakhpur is among UP's fastest-growing urban conglomerates. Music shops here stock the latest cassettes, CDs and state-of-the-art music systems. Social scientists maintain that 50 years since independence among the major milestones which transformed rural society in India was the abolition of Zamindari. Abolition of Zamindari has been very, very significant in terms of the social development in our country. Uh, consequently, what you find is that uh, a, the earlier tenant castes or tenant classes have now moved in to those places which were vacated by the zamindars. And uh, while they have not become zamindars themselves, there has been a significant upward mobility. And this upward mobility can be evidenced not only in terms of the economic strength, but also politically. Earlier, the zamindars or their factotums spoke on behalf of these people. Now these people are speaking for themselves. after independence, the greatest change is being witnessed in a social order virtually frozen for over 2,000 years, but now in turmoil. Its traditional institutions thrown into a whirlpool of change. The equality ushered in by the magic of universal adult franchise was the first mantra of this social upheaval. Perhaps the most creative changes were initiated by adult franchise, and I have a feeling that the deepening and enriching of Indian democracy and the expansion of democratic participation is probably the greatest achievement of this society over the last 50 years. In fact, it has released new energies uh, from the peripheries of the society and in some sense allowed groups, communities which were previously voiceless to come to the center of our public life. Over the past five decades, progressive legislation was an instrument that emancipated the stratified Indian mind. Affirmative action resulting in reservations for the scheduled castes and tribes in the spheres of employment, education and legislative representation was yet another step. Accompanied as it was by the abolition of untouchability by law. With one stroke of the constitutional pen, India became legally a classless or at least a casteless and uh, sectless society, which is really quite remarkable for a society that is supposed to be the most stratified in the world. So, of course, caste hasn't disappeared, sectarian strife haven't disappeared, but the ground rules have been established for a more modern and egalitarian system. It'll take a while for this to be actually realized in practice. But you see, the setting up of these ground rules, the setting up of these legal statutes, and the uh, uh, reservations for schedule castes and schedule tribes, I think these are very important steps which will take time to come to fruition. But without these steps being taken at that point, when it was taken, perhaps it'd have been many, many decades back in our social development. The Hindu Code Bill, enshrining women's right to share in property and legalizing divorce was another big step. 
the 73rd and 74th constitutional amendments brought devolution of power to the grassroot levels. It also gave empowerment to women citizens. All that we have talked about in the past can become a reality because now the women have become decision makers. They are within the power structure at the local level. And uh, you see there are one million women. I keep saying even if 25% of them are able really to assert themselves and bring in change, you have set in motion a social revolution in this country. Through these progressive measures, 33% of all elected seats in the village councils and town hall municipalities are now reserved for women only. The empowerment is gradually throwing up a new breed of female leaders. It is also propelling a movement whose core demand is to reserve 33% of all seats in parliament and state legislative assemblies for women. See, when one third women come and play their effective role in the polity of India, the focus will be on the women issues. As yet their issues are not focused, but then there'll be a very big focus on those issues. And naturally, when uh, they will be in the deciding seat, those who have suffered themselves, so naturally, the real solution will emerge. Traditional Indian society is undergoing a revolutionary transformation. In the urban cities, a new pedigree of working class women can be noticed, many of them holding high executive positions. The gigantic leap forward of this workforce is creating its own social dynamics within the family and society. Despite the fact that radical land reforms were never implemented, the efforts made towards social egalitarianism gave an impetus to transform the rural hinterland. While the rural landscape was coming to terms with freedom, and while it battled the social impact of a changing lifestyle, it was the Green Revolution that brought about a fundamental change in some parts of the country. Dictated by the compulsions of a need to feed its hungry millions. Compelled by a search for self-sufficiency as national ideology, political leaders embarked on a joint venture with agricultural scientists. This gave birth to a modern approach to farming and the use of hybrid seeds, manure and scientific implements ensured that the land was no longer infertile. From about 1968 onwards, our progress was more towards yield per hectare or per area and that was caused about by the high yielding varieties of wheat, of rice, of uh, jowar, bajra, maize and uh, they were all grown with water, irrigation water and good soil fertility management. The high yielding varieties were capable of converting irrigation water and soil nutrients into grains. Social scientists believe that this metamorphosis of the desolate landscape brought about in its wake a major change in the lifestyle of its people. It has changed the lifestyle of people. Uh, it has brought more people within the commercialized sectors, monetized sectors, and to the extent to, to, uh, that uh, some parts of the society have st are still outside the monetized sector, it has perhaps to some extent increased disparities. But that's a different issue. It has really, as you say, changed lifestyles dramatically. If the Green Revolution brought prosperity to the farming class, the nationalization of banks in 1969 unshackled many peasants from perpetual indebtedness to the rapacious landlord and moneylender. Later, a presidential ordinance issued on 19th July nationalized 14 major banks. Allegations that there were subsequent misuse of bank loans by politicians to increase their vote banks 
did not dilute the revolutionary impact it had on the Indian countryside. Loans from these nationalized banks empowered economically a new class of peasantry. Chaudhary Charan Singh, a political leader from Uttar Pradesh, who later went on to become Prime Minister of the country for a brief period in 1977, was perhaps the first to articulate the aspirations of the newly emergent peasant classes in the late 1960s. His political outfit was a novel experiment at creating a political constituency of social backwardness. Others expanded upon this idea with the help of legislative instruments. In the years to come, the political class in many North Indian states would be led by those who championed the cause of this social strata. In 1990, this politics of backwardness determined the national agenda when the central government accepted the report of the Mandal Commission. The affirmative recommendations of this report changed India's social and political agenda. Today, its beneficiaries regard this as the totem pole that bestowed on them self-respect. Its critics are unanimous that it has politically legitimized caste politics and thereby fractured society further. In the Mandal uh, recommendation, unfortunately, it seems that caste is going to be used as a perennial political resource, something that, has, that can be routinely, you know, uh, used for political purposes. You can routinely mine into it. It's like a rich vein, a rich ore. You can you know, keep on and on and on, dredging out these caste prejudices and caste uh, values and caste loyalties from time to time for political purposes. Whatever its merits or demerits, Mandal became the muscular symbol of political assertion of the economically emergent but socially repressed sections. What you see as the Mandal upsurge uh, is part of a larger upsurge, a consolidation of the political power of the so-called backward classes, um, who in any case deserve to have access to that power because of their numbers. They are in the majority in the society, not people like you and me. During the last half century, it is in the small towns that a new India is also emerging. These towns have become a nucleus for a variety of industrial products. Aligarh has become famous for manufacturing over 90% of all the locks made in the country. Near Gurgaon in Haryana is where almost 30% of bicycles are manufactured. But while there is a sense of prosperity in these townships, they also represent the unplanned growth in urban India. The majority of migrants from the rural villages still flow into the huge metropolitan cities. The smaller towns represent the churning of India, a social mobility of massive dimensions, leading to a reworking of the rural-urban equation. Let us take a ride now from Delhi to um, Dehradun. And on the way you pass Muzaffarnagar, Merad, Muzaffarnagar, Muradabad and so forth. And really, you're, it's like continuous urbanization, what they call conurbation. You know, the small towns dotting the entire route. And people in these villages find jobs in these small towns, or they sell their wares in the small towns. And these small towns are increasing very, very rapidly, simply because of the fact that the people in these villages are no longer satisfied with village life. By 1991, the country was coming to terms with its social disorder. A disorder created by the assertions of a new class of empowered citizens and by a rival attempt to mould religion into a political agenda. The economy had found itself frozen in its overt concerns with socialism and dependence on state intervention. It was in this period that the country took a radical step to stride out of a past mindset 
and embrace a global economic vision. The liberating of this economy brought in its wake a new revolution. It coincided with the growth of the telecommunications industry in the country and the advent of satellite television. The veritable jungle of TV antennae and even satellite dishes stand testimony to the steady fulfillment of the aspiration of a new class of Indians, realizing their dreams not in full measure but substantially. The new emerging upper middle class, exposed to global value systems, is not totally devoid of its traditional moorings. Shubha Mudgal is a classical singer of repute. In an effort to reach out to music fans globally, she uses the internet. A website created by her gives information on the various ragas. The idea of actually putting up a website on Indian classical music came because I thought A, that the internet is a wonderful way of communicating with people all over the world. It's possibly the best way of communicating. And the other thing that I saw on the internet was that there are very few uh, sites on Indian classical music that are manned by people who are actually practicing the art. In the cities and even smaller towns, fashion shows capture the celebratory mood of the young designers. They transform the fabrics and use traditional motifs and craft to fuse a modern look. These designers use cyberspace to reach out to a global customer data. The website that uh, I'm uh, we're doing is as a show window for Indian fashion. We've had an amazing response. I mean, we've got a whole lot of uh, people subscribing to it and you know wanting to know more about it. And uh, we keep changing the look and, you know, so it's actually trying to update Indian fashion and to let people know what's happening in the fashion industry in India. In restaurants and five-star hotels, cyber cafes are used by clients to while their time, communicate with the rest of the world through the internet. Social scientists now argue that the fruits of this new consumer society, economically fortified, must also reach out to the deprived sections of the country, to lend them a helping hand, to ensure that the social disparity which torments the nation at present can be bridged. The real challenge is how to bridge this gap in the upper crust and the rest. It is happening very slowly. I think in due course of time, there will be a new entrepreneurial you know, thrust, which has to come. Otherwise, uh, we'll, we'll have a class of people who are urbanized, have all the access, uh, access to all, the, all kinds of uh, consumption goods, and you'll have other people who, for whom consumption goods only means soap, oil, bicycles, uh, radio perhaps, you know, and nothing else. India today is a society in transition. In the jungle of contradictory images, of contrapuntal value systems, a new India is emerging. The last 50 years cannot be deemed as a long time for a civilization that claims a 5,000 year ancestry. But these 50 years have redefined its civilization. And as it marches on to the new millennium, Critics claim the answers to the future will lie in how democratic institutions in the country can be preserved, how the provocation of those deprived for centuries can be absorbed, and the passion of the marginalized converted into productive participation towards nation building.